This is Twit. Tell us what's going on with Changi and China and Changi Six. Well, well, uh, this is this is great. I mean, I think that that Mike, who's been leading the coverage for Space.com, uh, can weigh in uh, a little bit more. But just to, to set the stage, we are on. Well, a few a few years ago, uh, China made history when uh, was it in twenty eighteen? Is that when they did it? Uh, they landed the Changi Four moon lander and rover on the far side of the moon, and that was like the first time we'd ever done that. Anyone, all humanity has ever done it. So it was a big first for China. So now they're going to send their latest probe, the Chang'e 6 uh, mission, also to the far side of the moon, but also to like the southern kind of polar area of the moon. And they're going to bring back samples. So it's this really ambitious lunar sample return mission uh, to the moon's far side. And we think, uh, and I think Mike's going to correct us, we think it's happening this weekend, right, Mike? Is that is that it in a that's, nutshell? That's what people think. You know, it's it's yeah, it's hard to tell a lot of times. I mean, China is not the most open about their space flight their their space flight plans, which is sort of in keeping with like a lot of of their announcements and so on. You know, NASA would have told us exactly what time landing is, and there would be a live stream for it and all that stuff. But China, you just they they tend to give us very little notice, and so we kind of have to rely on kind of outside sources and. I mean, it seems like that's it's targeted for Saturday evening, um, and we'll see if that happens. Like, yeah, they kind of know around eight that, eight p.m. Eastern time, maybe is what people mm-hmm. think. And that'll um, be that'll actually be Sunday morning, uh, Beijing time. Uh, I, if, yeah, or or yeah, or even like the afternoon or something. But um, yeah. and so yeah, it and and kind of like you'd mentioned, Tark, it's it's like a it's the next step for their moon for, yeah for their robotic moon program they they've like they've already landed on the far side of the moon they did that in in very early 2019 so um and then they've 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 done a sample return mission from the near side of the moon they did that in late 2020 and so this is like a combination of those two they're going to do a sample return mission from the far side of the moon which we haven't done before nobody's done that before because nobody had had, yeah, had even landed on the far side of the moon until they did it in 2019. So it'll it'll be a big step forward in spaceflight if they can pull it off. And I certainly wouldn't doubt them. They've pulled off a lot of impressive kind of spaceflight feats recently, and this is just the the next ex- yeah the next escalation of that. And um, it's it's pretty interesting scientifically. You know, this is I mean I'm I'm sure part of the reason they're doing this is because it's never been done. So it's a it's a prestige thing for China, which is pretty important for them. Um, but also, you know, there are big differences between the near side and the far side of the moon, which scientists don't really understand. There are a lot of those big kind of dark, dark seas on the moon. We call well, we like, yeah, we call them the, seas. Maria. The, the um, Maria. Yeah. So there are a lot of those in the near side. We're sort of used to seeing them. Those are old. Like, yeah. I mean, super old kind of like volcanic flows that have hardened over time. There aren't nearly there. There are very few of those on the far side and scientists don't really understand why it's the same body. Why are there such big differences between how it looks in the near and how it looks in the far side? So, I mean, getting some samples back from the far side and you can kind of look at them up close could theoretically help explain what went on geologically on the far side of the moon and why it's so different from the near side. I mean, and It'd just be cool to to like be able to look at something from a place that we we really don't understand very well. So I like I like that he keeps calling it Rod the the far side and not the, the dark, dark side. side. Oh, <laughs> the dark side. I can't um, stand it when you hear that. And even <laughs> experienced people say that sometimes. This guy, that's right. Ding dong. <laughs> so I'll just add. Uh, we'll come back to to Changi Six, but I'll just add. We have Changi Seven scheduled for 2026, which uh, will also be going to the South Pole region which has, I believe, an orbiter, a rover, and a flyer, which will be able to hop from place to place on the lunar surface, which is pretty cool. And then wow. probably for 2028, Changi 8, which will be an ISRU in situ resource utilization experiment that will do attempt to do 3D printing with lunar regolith, which is challenging because you've got you've to grab the dirt you got to sift it, sort it into the right size particle, and then uh, extrude it with some kind of binder. Um, th- th- there's a number of ways to do it. You can also do sintering if you're looking at metal, but since they're going to just probably be looking at, I, I assume, powdered basalt wherever they land, they'll need some kind of binder. But it's hard. You know, this is just a small demonstration. I mean, we're, we're years away from seeing this on a big scale, but 
this is aggressive. I mean, that's the year we're supposed to be, that's past the time we're supposed to be landing astronauts of Artemis. And my prediction. Yes, Rod. Bet you, for that, <laughs> bet you for that chair. Not much, not much of a stretch is that China, they, you know, they say 20, early 2030 to early 2030s for a human landing. It's going to be 2029 because that's the 80th anniversary of the Communist Party's uh, conquest of China when they um, managed to mis- to displace the uh, Kuomintang government out to Taiwan. So, yeah. you know, well, it's hard and there's to been- imagine that, that, you know, anything short of certain death for the crew, I don't think is going to stop them from trying to make that deadline. But but who knows? Well, we, we should recap just briefly. I mean, we, you, you talked about the next missions to come, but so the Chang'e 1 mission launched in 2007. That was in the first orbiter that China launched uh, to to study the moon. Then they launched uh, Chang'e 2 in 2010. Uh, and that that was another orbiter that was uh, very successful at uh, imaging the moon. And I think they sent that to a Lagrange point. Is that right? After it was over with, Mike? So they I, had like, a, yeah, I, I believe I they did. I'll have to look it up, but that, that sounds right. And then for Chang'e 3, uh, they they put the 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 lander and then the U2 uh, rover uh, on on the, the 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 earth facing side of the moon and you know did all of their their exploration that was uh, great. No, the, the Cheng, and then Chang'e 4 was the uh, far side lander, mm-hmm. correct? Uh, uh, with 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 a rover and because it's on the far side, they also built relay satellites, the Kwekwe. Uh, satellites to be able to well beam the done. signals back, right? And and then they followed that up with the Chang'e five Ti or E T E T. Anyway, it was like a they they, they launched Ti. Yeah, they launched they launched a capsule around the moon and brought it back to prove that they could do sample return. Then they launched the Chang'e five sample return mission, which had the orbiter and the return vehicle and the lander and all of that fun stuff. Uh, and then now here we are, and that was in 2020, and then now here we are in, in, in 2024 with this Chang'e 6 mission. So like five, six years apart, between four to six years apart, each of these missions, you know, plop, 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 all the way up to here, uh, and then a, a, l- a bit more of a, a packed schedule going to uh, Chang'e 7, Chang'e 8, uh, you know, every two years now uh, going forward. So it's been a bit of a, um, uh, like a locomotive of building up to this point. Well, and we should mention what what it's building toward. If if like if everything goes well for China, you know they've got this big plan to do a moon, like a moon base near the South Pole called called the ILRS, the International Lunar Resource the, Research yeah, Station. Re- research Station. Yeah, they're they're partnering with Russia on that theoretically, and and a few other nations who have signed up for it. It's it's like kind of their version of the Artemis program, and it's doesn't have anything to do with Artemis. There's not going to be any cooperation between the two, but it's sort of it's sort of like the new space race to the moon. Um, and they're, they're basically hoping to set up like a, yeah, like a crude outpost kind of near the moon South Pole in the mid 2030s or kind of late 2030s. So all of this stuff that they're doing with, with, you know, with uncrewed Chang'e missions are to gain sort of all, all the knowledge that they need and all the skills that they need to build up toward that. And it's sort of, I mean, yeah, I mean, NASA is obviously doing something similar. Artemis aims to get a moon, like a crude moon outpost or more near the moon South Pole, kind of up and running by the late 2020s, early 2030s. We'll see if that happens. But yeah, so I mean, China has like similar ambitions. And and just like you said, Rod, I'm, I'm sure they would want to beat NASA to the moon with, you know, with astronauts, if at all possible. So they like might downplay that, but I'm sure that's a that's that's really important to them. That's, and of course, of course, dear important. listeners, when we say crude outposts, we don't mean like shanties on the moon. No, no, no. Crude, no, crude, crude with astronauts, C R E W E D. It's not Venus, okay? <laughs> so, you know, it's interesting you mentioned that because, um, I mean, nationalism is such a part of this. And on the one hand, they say, no, no, this is all meant in the spirit of peace, goodwill, and Bobby Sherman, and all that kind of stuff. But at the same time, um, if you read their white papers over the years, it's really clear and they, and they're, they're not shy about it. You know, this is a, for a great national program for goals. We're going to be world beating all that kind of stuff. They just have been a little quieter about it recently. It is worth noting, by the way, a couple of things. Then we've got one more break that um, Artemis, I think just signed was that their 41st or 42nd when Peru signed a uh, member. You guys remember? Oh, it's, it's somewhere in there. 40, it's 40 plus. 40. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's 41 or 42. 
And I think the ILR, ILRS, which is also invited international signatories, is at eight. Now, what does that really mean? Pakistan and, and so on. Belarus are signed on to, to the ILRS, whereas, you know. Belarus, shocking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Come here, vassal puppy. Um, but, you know, what these signatories really mean, I mean, I think China could get legitimate cooperation out of Russia because obviously Russia yeah. is a very experienced seasoned space power. Um, you know, in our agreement with some of the smaller countries, uh, you know, what Latvia or Peru will contribute, we don't really know. Those countries don't really know, at least the few I've talked to. So I think that's something we'll have to figure out. You know, is this just a gesture of goodwill from, you know, potentially non-aligned partners uh, or is it something more meaningful and will they eventually travel to the moon? I did also want to mention China's done something very clever, I think. You know, they're a very old civilization. They have really wrapped this program. You know, we name our spacecraft after after Greek Greek gods and goddesses for representation. And some Americans may actually know what that means. A, a lot probably don't. In China, though, they're really seeped in this whole national mythos and and so forth. So uh, Chang'e is the goddess of the moon and wife of Hu Yi, the great archer. She is renowned for her beauty and known for ascending to the moon with her pet rabbit, U2, the moon yeah, rabbit, yeah, and living too. in the moon palace. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And she is one well, of the major goddesses in Chinese mythology, blah, 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 blah. And their newer, their, uh, their crude vehicle for sending people to their space station and the moon and their lander are also have, have uh, sort of frou frou names. The space capsule, which looks a lot like the Dragon One, is named Meng Zhao, Vessel of Dreams, which I like that. Yeah, it's like nice. You can lie in it and take a nap. And their lunar lander, which looks a bit like a cross between the, the lunar module and the former Soviet unsuccessful lander, is called Lan Yue, which means embracing the moon. Hey, if you enjoyed this clip, be sure to check out This Week in Space. You can find us on your favorite podcast app or see the link in the description below. See you there.